All recordings are played only once. The test is in four sections. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the enrolment of the man's child at a nursery. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example. This time only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. My name's Laura. Welcome to Happy's Nursery. How can I help you today? Good morning. My wife and I were hoping that we might be able to enrol our daughter with you. We do have space, so that should be fine. What's the age of your daughter? She's two. So two is the correct answer. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good morning. My name's Laura. Welcome to Happy's Nursery. How can I help you today? Good morning. My wife and I were hoping that we might be able to enrol our daughter with you. We do have space, so that should be fine. What's the age of your daughter? She's two. Okay. Now I need to take some details first. Of course. To begin with, I need your and your wife's names. My name is Luke Beckett, and my wife's name is Gloria Beckett. Would you spell Beckett for me, please? It's B E C K E T T. And Gloria? G L O R I A. Thank you. And can I assume that you both live together at the same address? Yes, we do. Can I have the full address? It's forty Castle Crescent, Backley. And the postcode? It's B A three seven T R. Thank you. Now,、uh, can I take some telephone numbers for you and your wife? Of course. Our home number is o one five three eight eight five three two eight five. Thank you. And do you have mobile numbers? Yes, mine is o seven 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 o seven two eight. Four seven three, and my wife's is o seven seven four three, eight one two, four five one. Could you say your wife's again, please? Of course, it's o seven seven four three, eight one two, four five one. Thanks. I've got all that down. Could I also have work numbers for you both? My office number is o one five three eight nine two six. Four seven seven, and my wife's work number is o one five three eight five nine six eight two one. Thanks. Now I'll talk about our fee structure a little later. But how would you like to pay our fees? We'll pay by bank transfer when we get the invoice. That's fine. Thank you. So your daughter, what's her name? It's Gertrude Beckett. She has no middle name. Good. She's two years old. I know that. Does she have any allergies that you know of? The only one we know of is that she's allergic to cats. Okay, I've made a note of that. It won't be a problem. There are no animals in our nursery, and none of our teachers has a pet. Good. That's very reassuring. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Now I suppose you know quite a lot about us already, as you've chosen us to look after your daughter. That's right. We have friends who have their children here. That's good. I'd still like to talk about our systems here a little bit, though. Oh yes, that's fine. So we start doing activities at eight thirty a.m., but parents can drop off their children at any time after six thirty. From 6:30, we always have a team of carers here who will supervise your child while she plays with the others, and they will clean and change her when necessary. 
You don't need to bring anything in that regard, as we will have all that is necessary here. Do we need to bring anything else for Gertrude? Just a sweater for going outside and a couple of changes of clothing in case she gets dirty. Keep it in a good quality bag and have it clearly marked as Gertrude's. OK, what, what happens if Gertrude's sick? We will, of course, call you and your wife straight away if she's sick. You'll need to pick her up as soon as you can when that happens, as we don't want other children to catch illnesses. In the unlikely event of anything really serious, we're just a mile away from the county hospital. Also, we always have a nurse on duty who specialises in children, so your child will always have good supervision in terms of health. Good. Thank you. The end of da daytime activities is at four o'clock, though you can pick Gertrude up earlier if you wish. Also, we offer supervision until 6.30 for people who work late. We ask that you do not arrive later than that to pick up your child, as our staff will want to get home to their families. If you're unavoidably detained, please call our number, which is in our information pack here. That shouldn't be a problem for us, as we both finish work at around 4 o'clock. Good. Uh, finally, I'd like to tell you about a new service that we're running. It will cost extra outside our usual fee structure, but it's proving to be incredibly popular. We now offer supervision at the weekends so that parents can be free to shop, travel a little, or do other necessary things that would be awkward with a young child. I don't think we'd need that often, as we wouldn't like to leave Gertrude then, as we see her so little during the week. It would be very useful for unexpected things and emergencies, though. Well, now let's move on to the fee structure. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man giving some people information about an old age care centre. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and welcome to this open day at the Green Trees Old Age Centre. My name is Charlie and I would like to tell you a little about us today. I have met some of you already and I know that some of you are thinking of coming to stay here yourselves and some of you are here to see if it will suit a friend or relative of yours. So, we offer skilled elderly care for up to 60 residents. We have places for both men and women, with men being accommodated on the first floor and women on the second floor. We have three lifts that service all the floors for those who find stairs challenging. All our rooms are single, and therefore we are not suited to looking after married couples together. All our rooms are en suite and are clean daily. Some types of pet are allowed, but this has to be discussed with the manager. The manager will decide on a case-by-case -case basis. The common areas are exceptionally luxurious. We have lounges, television rooms, and a games room which are open to all residents. Our dining room is as well appointed as the rest of our facilities, and our food is exceptional. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are served, of course, every day, and specialized diets, for example, for diabetics, can be catered for after consultation. If residents get hungry between meals, there is coffee and tea available mid-morning with snacks, and afternoon tea is served every day with sandwiches and cakes. In good weather in the summer, afternoon tea is served outside on the lawn. One important part of any old age centre is our facilities for nursing. Older people need a special type of care the older they get, and this must be combined with opportunities to retain the chances for being independent as much as is practical. Green Trees has full-time nurses on duty 24 hours a day. These nurses have specialised in old age care 
and are all greatly experienced in this field. We also have access to extra specialized carers when the need arises. In addition to this, we have a local GP who visits twice a week. This GP is also able to visit at other times when necessary, including at night time. Green Trees is a fee charging establishment. I don't want to tell you about all our fees here, but all the details are available on our leaflets by the door and also on the website. The fees advertised are our current ones, but be aware that fees change every six months, depending on our own costs. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Green Trees also has a variety of activities for our residents, both inside and outside our premises. Our activities provide our residents opportunities to have fun, exercise their brains and bodies, and meet new friends. Twice weekly we have sessions in our games room. This includes playing cards, bingo, board games, quizzes, and lots of other activities. At Green Trees, we know it's important to meet different people, and so residents are always allowed to invite a guest to these evenings. In this way, everyone gets to meet new people and develop new friendships. We also have regular puzzle sessions at different times of the day, with crosswords, sudoku, and other stimulating and fun activities. One exciting and new venture that we're doing right now is getting residents to tell their life stories. Sometimes it's not so easy to recall everything, but the attempt often brings back things previously forgotten. We also encourage the recollections to be recorded or written down, which is great for younger relatives who find out things that they never would do otherwise. All these activities lead to fitness in the brain for seniors, and this has become an important part of lifelong well-being. It's equally important to get out of green trees from time to time. We run regular visits to the theatre, ballet, opera, cinema, local markets, and to places of local interest. We only organize one-day trips in case our residents get too tired. Family members can, of course, take residents out for overnight trips or longer whenever they want. We ask, of course, to be kept informed of any time spent away so we can organize our food and care schedules accordingly. One very popular activity in green trees is gardening. We have extended gardens, and when the weather is appropriate, residents can change their clothes and go outside and get dirty. Gardening can be a very fulfilling activity for the elderly. Tending plants can overcome feelings of isolation by giving individuals the opportunity to play a more active part in the world around them. Being responsible for the care of plants can also help residents feel more in control. The problem for a lot of elderly people is that manual work in the garden can cause serious aches and pains, whilst also worsening existing problems. We will give you training and the special tools that will help you stay safe and healthy. Our two gardeners will also be there to supervise and give advice, and I'm afraid residents also have to follow their orders about what is planted and where. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear four students discussing their engineering work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Tanya, 
Hi, Ross. Hi, Derek. Hi, Tanya. Have you seen Lily? Yes, she's just behind me. Here she is. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lily. You know Ross, don't you? Yes, I do. Hi, Ross. Hi, Lily. So, Lily, do you know what you're doing for your engineering work placement? Well, you know I applied for something in aviation engineering. Yes. Unfortunately, my application for that was turned down. So I also applied for a practical job working on bridge construction in Brisbane. Was that successful? No. They called and said someone else had taken the job, so I applied for a job helping in an engineering office in town. So that's what you're doing? They offered me and I was about to accept when the bridge people called and said the person who'd accepted had dropped out, so I've ended up with that. Well done. You'll learn a lot with that. Yes, and it'll look great on your CV. I'm sure it will. It's not aviation, but it'll still be very interesting. What about you, Ross? Well, I didn't have too much trouble. Fortunately, my father has an engineering firm, so he's taken me on. That should be great fun. It might be, but you don't know my dad. He'll work me to death. It might have been better just to have done some road surveying for the local government. It would have been boring, but at least nine to five. I thought that you'd applied for work on an oil rig off Borneo. No, I wanted to do that, but they said I didn't have the breadth of knowledge for working there. And Derek, what about your plans? I had a placement working out in the Antarctic, but I had to turn it down. Oh no, why? I was worried about the extreme cold, but they said that I'd be okay with that. My dad's a doctor in a hospital, and he said that the months I was there would present no problems. However, my old trouble with blood circulation was noticed by the company supervisor working there, and she said it was too big a risk being so far from a hospital, in case this came back. That's a shame. Yes, it is, but I've got a good placement in Brisbane's Department of Roads. That fits in with what I want to do when I graduate, so things worked out well in the end. So that leaves you, Tanya. I had three offers in the end. Good for you. What were they? My tutor recommended working in a shipbuilding yard, as he's got some contacts there. He said I'd get a really constructive job there. The second was in gas drilling, as my cousin works in that, and he said he'd sort me out with something with him, where I'd learn a lot. The last was for the city engineering department. My boyfriend works there, and he wants me to be close. Which did you choose? Well, I've always been interested in geology and the search for underground wealth. So I chose the one searching for gas. That's the field I'd like to work in after graduation. Although I'll find myself far away from any civilization for most of my time. This one is right out in the desert. By the way, how do we notify our department about our choices? Do we just call them or tell our tutors? There's an online form that needs to be printed out and filled in. I don't think you can send it as an attachment. Ross is right. It needs to be signed by your tutor, and they need an original for their copy, so it needs to be given in face to face. You'd think that nowadays they'd accept the scan of a signed document that was sent by email. I mean, it's valid legally. You know our professors. Some of them don't even know how to open their email. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. So Tanya, working in the desert, that'd be a bit scary, won't it? I expect when I go at the start it'll be a bit frightening, but I've been told that you get used to it very quickly. So you're drilling for gas? That's right. That sounds interesting. We haven't studied many things like that, though. I know. So I've been studying it myself for a couple of months. The gas drilling station is a fairly standard assembly. The wellhead is where the hole to the gas reservoir starts, and it's above ground, next to a monitoring facility. That's where I'll be most of the time. The drill has to pass first through the normal earth until it hits a shale rock layer at around 40 metres. After that, it passes through some cap rock, and finally some storage rock. Then it hits the gas reservoir. Is it a long process? Quite long. The shale rock is easy to pass through, but the other layers are very hard and thick. So once the drill hits the gas reservoir, it's just a matter of monitoring? No. There's a constant need for working out how much gas is left and where the best place is to get it from. This means other holes may need to be drilled, and that's what I'll be doing. We have secondary holes at different depths 
to the side of the primary drill hole and underground sensors at the bottom send up information to the monitoring facility. This data then needs to be analysed. It'll be a fantastic thing to do, Tanya, and it'll be a great experience. If you want to work in that field later, it'll really help you find a job. It'll be quite a lot of pressure on you also. You'll be in the desert with a few colleagues making drilling decisions that will cost a lot of money. Not quite. We'll be analysing the data, but we'll be connected by satellite to the head offices, and it'll be the people there who make the decisions of whether to drill or not. Oh, good. That'll take the stress away. I'd hate to think what would happen if I had to make all the decisions out there. I don't think they'd let me do all the decision by myself in any situation. Anyway, it's not as if I'll be on my own out there. Don't you think you'll go crazy being stuck out there in the desert? Our placements are for six months, and after six months in the desert, I'd be feeling very strange. It won't be that bad. The teams that work out there are on four-week rotations. Everyone then gets a week off, and then they go to a different station. My situation will be different. After my four-week rotations, I'll be taken back to the city for four weeks, and then I'll just do nine to five on weekdays at the head offices until I return to my drilling station. It's a good mixture. Back in the head offices, I'll be able to see what they do with the data that we collect out in the desert. Well, that all sounds very exciting. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on hypnosis, hypnotism and hypnotherapy. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Today in our psychology lecture, we're going to look at hypnosis, hypnotism and hypnotherapy. First of all, let's look at some definitions. Hypnosis is an inferred psychophysiological state characterized by greater possibilities for influence and is thought to be an altered state of consciousness. Hypnotism is a study and use of suggestion with the presence of hypnosis, while hypnotherapy, or clinical hypnosis as it's sometimes referred to, is a form of therapy in which the use of hypnotism constitutes the core of the treatment. Simply speaking, hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness. Hypnotherapy, therefore, is the use of an altered state of consciousness, or trance, for a therapeutic endpoint. This means that people are not treated with hypnosis, but are treated in hypnosis. All hypnotic states are characterized by a tremendously pleasant state of calm, which individuals allow themselves to enter so that desired and beneficial suggestions may be given directly to the part of the mind known as the subconscious. Under hypnosis, the conscious and rational part of the brain is temporarily avoided, making the subconscious part, which influences mental and physical functions, receptive to therapy. During the trance state, there is heightened concentration for the specific purpose of maximizing potential, changing limiting beliefs and behaviors, and gaining insight and wisdom. Although hypnosis may be light, medium, or deep, a medium trance is usually used, during which breathing and the heartbeat slow, and the brain produces alpha waves. Normal levels of consciousness, such as sleeping, dreaming, or being awake, 
can be detected in the wave patterns produced by the brain. The state of hypnosis differs from all three. In alpha states, the body gradually achieves a particular relaxation. Hypnosis, meditation, daydreaming, being absorbed in a book or music or television, driving and arriving at your destination without recalling all the usual hallmarks, are good examples of alpha states. It is still not well known how hypnosis influences the brain. One popular theory is that it affects the mechanisms of attention, which occur in one area of the brain, called the ascending reticular formation, located in the brain stem. This area, which has many functions related to sleep, alertness and the sensorial perception, continuously bombards the rest of the brain with stimuli coming from the sense organs. The inhibition of the ascending reticular formation leads to states of extreme calm. So, how does hypnotherapy work? The subconscious mind is the source of many of our problems and self-images and our beliefs, habits and behaviours are stored there as information. The subconscious is a tremendous reservoir of our unrecognised strengths and knowledge. Hypnosis is a natural and effective technique for accessing the subconscious mind and the key to unleashing our potential so that we can change our unwanted habits and behaviours and find solutions to our problems and concerns. Once the individual has achieved a hypnotic trance state, the hypnotherapist uses many different therapeutic methods, ranging from simple suggestions to psychoanalysis. For example, the therapist may ask about past, present or future concerns to establish the reasons for a particular problem. Alternatively, the therapist may give suggestions to the subconscious mind aimed at overcoming specific problems such as lack of self-confidence. While some uses, such as calming a person, need minimal change on the part of the individual, more complex behaviours such as overeating, panic disorders or depression require a more complex therapeutic intervention together with psychological homework. Hypnotherapy is a form of healing subject to much scepticism in the medical and scientific professions, in spite of it being conducted by qualified practitioners. Whilst it has often been clearly ascertained through various studies that a course of hypnotherapy can coincide with the improvement of a patient's medical condition, it is not simple to draw a direct correlation between that improvement and the process of hypnotherapy itself. This is partly because there are few visible or extreme changes to metabolism during hypnotherapy. Further to this, patients react very differently, and so a representative sample may not be all that representative at all. This makes it difficult to ascertain who reacts well to hypnotherapy and who just has a natural propensity to recover from the ailment that they were treated for. Many tests have shown that hypnotherapy has helped patients' conditions in conjunction with traditional medicine and that the effect of the hypnosis has only had a purely placebo basis. Patients therefore often have a positive mental response to treatment but that this is only the patient's perception and is not due to the success of the treatment. Finally, hypnotherapy is often criticised because those criticising it have little knowledge of the processes and underlying methodology. Whilst there are doubts about the reliability of hypnotherapy as a method of healing, or indeed as a method for helping people to deal with stress or to quit smoking, there seems no reason to doubt the effective results that it seems to produce in some patients. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.